Good morning, everyone. And it's always so wonderful to have a gathering of women. I've been in women's ministry for over 30 years, doing retreats and days of prayer and workshops and everything else. And you're absolutely my favorite people to hang around with. So <laughs> I'm really, really happy to be here. And, um, and thank you to this wonderful team for this beautiful job that they did in, in making this such a welcoming environment here today. You know a little bit about me, but I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about my story and my uh, faith journey. That way you know where I'm coming from, and I in no way have arrived in my life at any uh, pinnacle of my spiritual journey. I'm, I'm traveling just like all of you. I always like to say that we're pilgrims. You know, I, I'm a spiritual director also in, in the Diocese of Orange, and I like to refer to my directees as pilgrims, you know, because we're, we're just all walking each other home, like they say, you know, we're all journeying together. And one thing I want to say about that beautiful scripture that was read this morning, you know, when it comes to women, because one of the ways that I've also taught, um, not only the beautiful reflection of faith that we hear in that story, but also there were, there were mat carriers, mat carriers for that man that was lifted through the roof of that house. And we, especially as women, you know, are called to be mat carriers for one another. No matter what we're going through in life, there's a lot of times we can't do it on our own. And that's why we need each other. And sometimes we're in the center of that mat, and sometimes we're at the corner of that mat, carrying someone else, right? So when I see all of you women here today, I, I just, I thought of that when I was listening to that scripture again, because that's a very important part of who we are as women. We do become mat carriers in our life, but also realizing, like we heard in the introduction too, that sometimes we have to be on the center of that mat, and sometimes we have to allow people to carry us as well, okay? So, I grew up, actually grew up on the East Coast in a family of six children. Um, wonderful childhood of growing up in Catholic schools and knowing about God from a very young age and being brought up in the faith, so to speak. Um, went through all of my schooling, got married to my husband, Jim. We've been married for, it'll be 40 years this year, which I'm really happy to say, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really a blessing. And we do, have, we have three children. Uh, Christopher's our oldest, he's 33. And then we have Tom is 29. And our youngest is Megan at 21. So, uh, after we got married, I, I, when I got married, Jim and I got married, I was actually working for an uh, airline at the time. I've been in airline marketing and sales. That was my previous life. Now, I, after I left that, I said, now I market and sell for Jesus. <laughs> so, um, still marketing and selling, though. But, um, so what happened is, is uh, I was working for the airline, and so I worked back east. I worked for British Airways, then we moved to San Diego. I worked for PSA. Does anybody remember PSA? Catch our smile, <laughs> that airline. And then um, US Air bought PSA. So I stayed on with them for a couple years. Um, and then I got a buyout and I uh, became a stay at home mom, which I was very happy to do. So then I was kind of in this place where I was a stay at home mom. Now I just, I just had uh, Christopher, our oldest, and he was uh, about four at the time. And I remember I had this time now to really think about where I was on my faith journey. You know, I had slowed my life down and I was at home now. I'm very happy about that. So I thought, you know, I'm going to start, read, I'm going to start reading scripture. That's what I'm going to start doing. I'm going to start reading the readings, you know, for the uh, Sunday Mass coming up. And um, so I started doing that. Just by myself in my backyard, I would put Chris down for a nap and I would just go in the backyard and I would just study the scriptures for the week. Little by little, what started happening is it really started changing me. It started changing my heart, started changing the way I see God, and all those beautiful stories that I read in scripture started really entering into my heart and my life. So one day I was sitting in the backyard, 
and it was a beautiful sunny day out. And I thought, you know, I know my prayers, God. I was talking to God saying, I know my prayers. I know my prayers I've learned from when I was little, my Our Fathers and my Hail Marys and my Glory Bees and the beautiful prayers of our tradition. But I realized that I didn't really know God. I didn't know God that I could sit there and really have a conversation with God, conversational prayer. So I said from the bottom of my heart, I wanted God to really teach me to pray. And so this is how it went. I wrote this poem and this is how it went. It's called, Lord, Teach Me to Pray. One day when I was sitting outside on a beautiful sunny day, I remember asking without much pride, Lord, teach me to pray. I long to know you better, your peace in my life I need. I want to turn to you in all I do, in every word and deed. I know my Lord was listening and I listened to hear him say, have faith that from this day you'll never ask, Lord, teach me to pray. I'll show you how to find my love in everyone you meet. Your life will be filled with joy and your joy will be complete. My child, write me your love in poetry and I'll give you the words to say. And have faith that from this day you'll never ask, Lord, teach me to pray. That day my life did take a turn and I finally saw the light. The Lord was so patient to wait for me until the time was right. And now each day I live for the Lord in all I say and do. And I thank you, Lord, from the bottom of my heart as I say, Lord Jesus, I love you. Amen. <laughs> And so that's how it happened. That's how I really say I really started on my journey. Um, because shortly after that, God introduced me to one of my neighbors that had just moved in on my block. And she said, hey, Kathy, do you want to start this prayer group for moms? You know, do you want to just get together at my house? And there was a lot of us moms now that we're home with our children. We organized a babysitter for the children. And we would meet every week at Kathy's house. And it was called Moms in Prayer. Moms in Touch at the time, now it's Moms in Prayer, which is a, actually an international ministry of moms praying for their children in schools. And that became my school of prayer, praying with other moms for the most precious thing in our lives, and that was our children. So the Lord answered my prayer there, and then from there it just went on and on and on. So I stand before you today as we, as we begin this journey together today, you know, to realize that all of us, you know, when we talk about finding our center, it starts in the smallest ways and everyone in this room is in a completely different place on that journey. But I hope together today, we won't look at this as just this nice morning of getting together, or nice day of getting together and listening to speakers, but that we really, really be present and receptive to what God may be talking to each and every one of you in a different way. Okay. So in my work as a, as a spiritual director, I hear over and over again and hold very, very dearly the sacred stories of people that I see in direction. And in my talk, I love, and when I talk, I love to use stories published, both published and personal stories, because I think stories can tell us so much. And again, they can resonate with us in many different ways. So I'm going to begin with this story <clears throat> that I love because it really talks about really what our opening invitation was to today is to slow down today. So a group of Americans were on a vacation in Africa. On the first morning, they all woke up early and traveled fast and covered a great distance. The second morning was the same. They woke up early, they traveled fast, and traveled far. The third morning, the same thing. But on the fourth morning, the local hired help refused to move. Instead, they sat by a tree in the shade well into the morning. So one American traveler became incensed and irate and said to the translator, this is a waste of our time. Can someone tell me what's going on here today? The translator looked at him calmly and answered, 
They're waiting for their souls to catch up with their bodies. They're waiting for their souls to catch up with their bodies. I, th I hope that's what we can do here this morning because we've made this time and this space. And I love that story because how many times in our life do we have to do that? We have to slow down and take time to really look at our soul and, and what's going on in our souls. So I'm going to start this morning by talking about finding your center, what that looks like and what uh, for each one of us and, and uh, in all, again, in all different ways, how that's going to resonate with you. Um, and then we're going to walk through this idea of discipleship, even discipleship in the broader sense too, of an evangelization of what's happening in our church today and our part in that um, as women. And we'll also be reflecting on some questions at our table. We'll have a time of reflection today, a time of sharing, and then a time of group sharing. So that's kind of uh, just a little bit of an outline for the morning. So I want to start with um, the idea of finding your center. A couple of uh, months ago, I, I lead a small faith group for women on Thursday mornings. There's only about 12 of us. And uh, we studied Bishop Robert Barron, who many of you probably know, Word on Fire, and right up north of here, right, in Santa Barbara. And we studied his, um, his group work called Three Paths to Holiness. And the three paths to holiness that he described in there were finding your center, to know you're a sinner, and that your life is really not about you. I think it was, uh, for us as women, it was a wonderful roadmap for really understanding what this whole thing means and becoming um, a disciple. So I'd like to start just talking a little bit about the first part of this uh, three-part series. I won't be talking about all of them in great detail, but finding your center. And I'm just going to grab my clicker here somewhere. Oh, they put up here. Thank you. Okay. I just wanted to say this photo is, uh, has anybody been to Guelph, the Jesuit center in uh, Guelph, Ontario? It's a beautiful retreat center if you ever get a chance to go there. But this is a picture of their labyrinth. In the center of their labyrinth is this beautiful little chair that you can sit in. I happened to go there last year at springtime, and I just love that photo because it brings me, to a, brings me back to that place. But when we're talking about finding your center in labyrinth work, um, it was just a beautiful place to have a nice little chair to sit down on. So it's one of my favorite photos. OK, so we're going to start with the rose window. Now, you all have a picture of the rose window there on your um, table. We'll be using that later, uh, the prayer and so forth in our prayer service. But um, just so you can look at it a little closer. The, I think everyone has one, right? Okay. So the rose window, has anybody been to um, Notre Dame in France? Okay, yes. It's, pretty, it's so beautiful and so breathtaking when you see it for the first time. But of course, you know, uh, we know that uh, Notre Dame means Our Mother, Our Lady, Dear Mother. There's a, a couple of different translations for it. But these rose windows in the, in the Gothic cathedrals uh, all throughout Europe, they were not only amazing um, displays of engineering and artistry, but they were also symbols of a well-ordered soul. The pilgrim, a pilgrim, would come to the cathedral for spiritual enlightenment. They would be encouraged to, med upon, to meditate upon the rose window, the light coming through the window, all the different facets of the window, to be drawn into this somewhat of a mystical conformity with the window. They were used as kind of, I would refer to them as a visio divina. You know, we know about Lexio Divina and all different, and Visio, that, that seeing, looking uh, Divina. So what would they see when they looked at this window? At the center of every rose window, and we actually even have one in our church at uh, St. Edward's down in Dana Point, um, there's a depiction of Christ. And even when Mary is holding Christ, Christ is at the center of the window. So she's carrying this Christ child, 
And again, it's a teaching for people to realize to put Christ at the center of their lives. Not only that, but when we're living in this center, everything else is going on around us and around us. But this is where we want to be, is right at the center with Christ in our lives. So the message is very clear in these windows. When one's life is centered on Christ, all energies, aspirations, and powers of the soul, they fall, they fall into this beautiful harmony, this beautiful harmony. And when, when something is at the center of our lives that's other than Christ, whether it's success, self-praise, the soul, the soul will fall into disharmony. So it's harmony versus disharmony. So Jesus expressed the same idea when he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and the rest will be given unto you, from Matthew 6, 33. When the divine is acknowledged in our life as the ground and organizing center of our existence, something like this, this wholeness, this holiness occurs in our life. The 16th century Spanish Carmelite mystic Teresa of Avila, most well known for her interior castle writing, she has this description, you know, of the soul and going through these different layers and layers and layers towards a deeper intimacy with God. She compares the soul to a castle, and there's seven interior rooms to that castle or dwelling places. And a person can enter into those dwelling places through prayer, and each uh, room is marked with a different success, succession of spiritual maturity in life. And the castle is in a most beautiful crystal globe, and the seventh place that you get to, the seventh room, is the dwelling place of God. And, the one, and when one gets closer to that center, that's when they, the light gets most intense, and that's when they're really connected to God. So her vision, uh, Teresa's vision, has offered a lot of wisdom for all of us on our spiritual journey over the centuries. And it's in this circular shape as well. So a person moves through the first three rooms, deepens their commitment and practice of prayer, and then they move on and on and on in all of these rooms. So within us dwells this sacred circle as well, at the heart of which beats God's presence in each and every one of us. We also have another circle, this circle of the church, this liturgical cycle in our church that's also in a circle when we see pictures of it, right? It's another circle. In the three-year cycle, you know, we go through all the readings, we go through uh, all the Gospels, and we believe that all of the text and everything that we read through the liturgical year also has that power to change and transform us. The circle is without a beginning and end, which symbolizes the eternal nature of the divine. And we even have that in our hosts. Our host is a circle. Again, it's a beautiful circle reminding us that there's no beginning and no end to God. So it is a universal symbol used all around the world. In churches, we often find that these stunning displays, like this rose window, it's, it was considered part of this French architect, uh, architecture, but the rose window really continues to function on different levels at once. So think about a time when you yourself were inside of a church and light was spilling in, you know, those beautiful scenes. The interaction between the light and the glass and the color, it brings you into this transcendent place where you know that you are in a sacred place, the presence of God. And it is where we would then long for the holy. So typically, Mary is at the center, Jesus is at the center. There's dome ceilings all around, and there may be a labyrinth again, a circular labyrinth on the floor like in the Chartres Cathedral in France, and they have this path that leads us and leads us and leads us to God. 
So I want to just also, you know what, rosaries are also an example of the sacred circle too, right? And I'd love to think of the rosary as um, holding Mary's hand. We hold Mary's hand when we're saying the rosary. Um, but again, it's a circular, it's a circular thing that we do. This is a, a little bit closer slide of it as well. <laughs> okay, so, but there's another circle. And also in the medieval times, they had these circles also, they call them the Wheel of Fortune. The Wheel of Fortune. And if you look at it, the Wheel of Fortune, it was also circular, but it was called the Wheel of Fortune because they had, uh, they had this whole idea that it was all about them, that they could reign at the top, they may fall down, they may be down the bottom, but then they work their way back up again. And they would keep going around and around and around on this circle. Sometimes I know in our lives it can feel like that for us as well. But the spiritual lesson is also very profound because throughout our life, the wheel of fortune turns, placing, sometimes, placing us sometimes in different positions, right? Sometimes we're at the top, sometimes you can relate to all of those, right, in our life. But the one thing we can be sure of is that the wheel revolves. There's a constant movement around it. But we can't live on this wheel going around and around like this, you know, the rim, the rim of the wheel. Shifting, moving, fading, changing all the time. We have to situate ourselves at the center, at the center. From the standpoint that's where Christ is. So at the center of the wheel, you know, we can assume this spiritual freedom when we're in the center of the wheel, the, and the soul that can do that is called detachment. So we detach ourselves from the spinning and the spinning and the spinning. So, so from a theological standpoint, we can say that we're either moving ourselves and our souls towards God or we're moving them away from God. Moving towards self, ultimately, we know can become hell on earth when we're moving ourselves uh, towards self. But when we're moving ourselves towards God and towards the center and all things in Christ, we get off of that wheel. We get off of that wheel and we find ourselves living in the center. So when... So on these wheels of fortune, this is what was said. When you were at the top, it was, I reign, regno, regnavi, I have reigned. That's when you're starting to fall. Sum sine regno, I am without a kingdom. I'm at my lowest point. And then, <laughs> regnavo, I shall reign again. So this is what they thought. They thought um, that the goddess Fortuna spins the wheel at random. It's actually found in Dante's Inferno, the Canterbury Tales. It was used to educate masses of people. There were people that believed this, that they were always in control, up and down and up and down. And it was found in the medieval art and in the windows of many cathedrals as well. Here's another picture of it. Here's the uh, goddess. But what, uh, but what's wonderful is when um, Father Barron, Father, I mean Bishop Barron, speaks brilliantly and links all of this interpretation to actually the Beatitudes. Because the Beatitudes are the dispositions of our heart. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are detached from material things. And how hard is that sometimes to detach from material things? He says, blessed are they who mourn. Blessed are those who are not addicted to feeling good. That can be an addiction, a real addiction as well. Instead of blessed are the meek, he describes it as blessed are those who are not self-centered. Blessed are those who thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those detached from sin. And blessed are the merciful. Blessed are those who are detached from revenge.
Blessed are the clean of heart. Blessed are those detached from evil thoughts. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those free from hatred. Blessed are you when they insult and persecute you and utterly and utter every evil against you because of me. Blessed are you if you don't care what people think. People living at the center don't care what people think in the sense that they don't find their approval through other people. They find it through God. So when we're living at the center of the wheel, we assume that this attitude of spiritual freedom that the soul masters calls detachment. We're detached from that. We don't need any of those worldly things because now we know where everything we have comes from. We're living at the center. And that doesn't mean that we won't have our trials and we won't have our sorrows. We drink from both of those cups in our life. We drink from the cup of joy and we drink from the cup of sorrow. But that doesn't mean that it will consume us if we're living at the center and we're living from God at the center of our being. So we don't want to be living on the rim or living in this apathy or this apathetic way of living. We want to be living in the ho'on, the ho'on, which is the one who is, the one who is. Saints who lived in the center and detached Life's ups and downs no longer controlled them. They no longer exhausted them. Because again, they were living from a place where Christ was ruling. Christ was in the center of everything in their lives. And spiritually, of course, we have to do the same. So we're not moving up and down on that wheel constantly. And the still point always remains the same, that it's Christ. Bishop Barron also said that when Jesus becomes the center of your life, then your mind, your will, your emotions, your private life, your public life, all of it, finds its harmonious place around the center. There's a saying that a comfort zone is a beautiful place, but nothing ever grows there. The other saying I like to use is, A ship is always safe in the harbor, but that's not what it was built for. You know, we were built to to move out and to send forth. That's what we were built for, not to just stay safe in the harbor in our lives. So we move out of our comfort zone, growing with God. It's all about stepping off that wheel of fortune that we may be on or may continue to jump back in and back off of and entering into this life from the center, which is Christ-centered. And it's all about realizing in this world that we are sinners, we need reconciliation, but we also know that we can live from the one thing, the one thing that's necessary, like in Martha and Mary, the one thing that's necessary, and that's to sit at the feet of Jesus each and every day. Father Gregory Boyle, which many of you know from Homeboy Industries and his ministry working with gangs, he makes the distinction between the God that we live by and the God that we actually have. He says the God we actually have, his love for us is always at a highest setting. God is too busy loving you and me All he asks for us to do is to give up nothing, just reset the compass of our souls. Reset the compass of our souls and give in to that tenderness that God offers us each and every day and find our center in Christ. When I was preparing and praying about coming here today, You know, God told me to tell you one thing, besides all of this also. But he said, tell them that I love them. Tell them that I'm crazy about them. Because they don't hear that enough. And some don't believe it even. But we have a God that is so crazy about each one of us. If he had a wallet, our picture would be in it. If he had a wall, 
our picture would be on the wall. But he loves each of us so much right where we are. So I'm just passing that on today, that we never, ever forget that. Okay, so the second step in this path to holiness, <clears throat> and I'm just briefly going to talk about this, is to know that you are a sinner. And I don't have to talk about that for too long because we know we're sinners, right? <laughs> but, you know, to sin is like caving in on oneself. It's when you cave in on yourself when you're in a state of sin. It's all about you. You're caving in on yourself, and it's really hard to grow. It's hard to be fruitful. It's hard to find your center when you're living in sin. St. Irenaeus, one of my favorite sayings, is the glory of God is a man, or woman, I'll paraphrase, fully alive. And when we're in sin, we can't be fully alive because that sin keeps us from that fullness that Jesus is always offering. Sin takes away our wholeness. And we're not the only ones that struggle with it. Even St. Paul, after 25 years in his life of serving and following Jesus, he said, what I do, I don't understand. What I do, I don't understand. But when you move towards living and finding your center, you know, you find it gets easier and easier in your life to give up those things that may be taking you away from God. And maybe it's something as simple as gossiping, or maybe it's something as simple as attitude, negative attitudes, or bad attitudes, or whatever it is, whatever it is, pride, anger, all of the things that, that we could uh, be living in sin over. But that's where the transformation happens, the closer we get off that wheel, that outer wheel. Okay, so that's enough of sin. I just wanted to mention that today because it is an important part of kind of getting this clearing, finding your center, trying to live not on the wheel, and then entering into the next place, which would be knowing that our life is not about us. So I want to tell you a story of uh, our middle son. When he was um, playing football at Santa Margarita, which is a Catholic high school down in um, Orange County, the first day that he started uh, training one summer, the coach gave them each a T-shirt. And on the back of the T-shirt were these um, letters, I-N-A-Y, I-N-A-Y. He didn't tell the boys what it meant. He wanted them to figure it out. By the end of summer training, he wanted somebody to figure out what that meant. So by the end of the summer, nobody figured out what it meant. And so they said, Coach, what is this? What does this mean, these letters? He said, it means it's not about you. It's not about you. And if you're going to play on my team, our team, I want you to never forget that it's not about you. And Jesus can say that same thing to us, right? It's not about us. So we're gathered, we're healed, and we're sent out on this mission. But we can only be great missional disciples if we know it's not about us. So God speaks, God calls, and then he sends his people out. He said to Moses in front of the burning bush, he sent Moses out, I am who I am. And then Moses needed to go. Jeremiah, he said, I'm too young. I'm too young. And God said, let's go. I have a job for you to do. But it's not about you. It's not about what you have, because we know that God doesn't call the equipped, that he equips the called. So when God tells us to move, we move with God, but even if we don't know if we have everything we need, because it's not about us, it's about what God is going to do through us. So it is a higher calling when it's not about us. So the first part of our lives, you know, we can all probably relate to this. Some are still in the first part of their lives, but it's all about my plans and my hopes and my future, and we we set our own agendas, so to speak, 
We set our own sails, right, of where we want to go and what we want to accomplish. And... But the second half of our life, the second half of our life, someone else can tie us up. And hopefully that's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit can so invade our life and change every single thing that we sell out, you know, that we sell out when we sell out to the Holy Spirit and to God in our lives. And then it's about God's plan and it's not about our plan anymore. And from Ephesians 3.20, it says that now to him who is able to do exceedingly more than we could ever ask or imagine, according to his power that's at work with that, within us, we learn how to surrender then to that power, that we can't do it all. So it's not about us. And again, we get back to the one thing necessary, just to sit at the feet of Jesus. So I want to talk a little bit about this right here about this so this is what we enter into in our lives sometimes we're in this ego drama which is written by me produced by me and and it oh by the way it's starring me or starring us or we can enter into the theodrama which is god's plans god's desire god is producing it god is directing it those are two choices that we have in life. And you know, this whole idea of this came from this um, wonderful Swiss theologian, a Catholic priest, his name was Hans von Balthasar. He actually wrote a book called The Theodrama. He loved music, he loved plays, he loved everything having to do with drama. And so he came up with these, this idea that these are the two places that we can live in life. But we can't help God if we're living in the ego drama. We can't surrender to God if we're living in the ego drama. So I want to talk about this next, but before I do that, I want to share another story. And this story has to do with who we are and why we're here and what we're doing here, right now, at this very place in our life. And it's a story about a rabbi, and his name is Rabbi Akiva. And this story has been passed down for generations and generations within the Jewish tradition. Rabbi Akiva, he was born in the first century AD, just a few years after Jesus lived out his life among the people of Israel. The story is told that late one afternoon as the sun was beginning to set in the west, Rabbi Akiva was walking along the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee on his way home to Capernaum. Rabbi Akiva was doing what most God-fearing, God-honoring Jews would be doing with their spare time. He was meditating upon the scriptures, especially where the Lord says, but you are my witnesses, O Israel, you are my servants, you have been chosen in me, and I alone am your God. Rabbi Akiva was so focused upon the text that he didn't realize that he, instead of taking a turn left towards the city gates of Capernaum, he had taken a right turn, and the sun was beginning to sink in the sky. He realized now it was getting dark, and he came upon this fortress, realizing that he was at a Roman fortress. So as he stood at the front gate, realizing what had happened, he heard a voice coming down from above the gate, and it was a voice of a Roman sentry guard standing on top of the wall. The guard shouted to the stranger, who are you and what are you doing here? Rabbi Akiva was so startled, he could only respond to these frightening words with, what? Again, the guard called out to him, who are you and what are you doing here? Rabbi Akiva had a few moments to gather his thoughts and shouted back up into the night sky, 
How much do you get paid for asking me those questions? The guard was now confused as to why this stranger would ask that question. So the guard responded, two drachma per week. Now a drachma was worth about a day's wage. So then Rabbi Akiva, with intense conviction, shouted back to the Roman sentry, I'll pay you double if you stand outside my house every day and ask me those two questions. Who are you and what are you doing here? Why would a Jewish rabbi be willing to pay a Roman Gentile stranger double his salary for him to simply stand outside of his house and ask him those two questions every morning as he opened his door? What does that tell you about those two questions? The first is a question of our identity. Who are we? We know whose we are. We know whose we are. But who are we? And it's not, I don't mean your name or anything else, but who are you really? And what are you doing here? What are you doing here in this time and this place right now in human history? And what has God given you, your life now, for this very specific place and time that you're in? These are the questions that we ask. These are the questions that, the big questions that we can ask. But as we move into being a disciple, being a woman of discipleship, these are the questions we ask. We know what we do. We know if we have a family or we know what our jobs are and everything else. But these get to the deeper questions that, that we have to continue to ask ourselves. Who are we and what are we doing here? And what are we called to do here also? You know, I, I teach in the a called and gifted workshop. That, that is something that I've been doing for 10 years now. And I know that Father Michael wants to actually bring that here to the parish. And ironically, when I was asked to come here to speak and realize that Father Michael was the pastor, he was actually the one that trained me 10 years ago to be a called and gifted presenter. So it was pretty ironic that our paths crossed again here. But one of the things that we teach in that workshop is that each one of you has a very specific call. You've been given what we refer to as a spiritual gift or a charism, and there's 24 of them that we teach on. And those 24 charisms, you have at least one that's been given to you at baptism. And attached to a call, I mean, attached to a charism is also a call. And I just want to use this time also to encourage you that when you do have that workshop here at St. Dominic's to try to attend it, it's, it's really life-changing as far as understanding where God may be calling you in life. And, and I don't care what age you are, you know, what age you are, there's still a call on your life, you know, there's still a call on your life. God's not finished with you. And it's really important to remember that, you know, that we just don't fade away, that we don't retire until we go to heaven, honestly. <laughs> if we're Christian people, Christian women, we don't retire until we go to, to heaven. That really is the reality that we have to think about. I don't know if any of you know Corey Ten Boom. Have you ever uh, read her book? You, do you know her story? Um, Corey Ten Boom was, um, she was uh, uh, hiding um, Jews in her home in Amsterdam, she and her family, and they got caught, and she went to a concentration camp. Her whole family went to different concentration camps, but she and her sister uh, went to the same concentration camp. She lived through that horrific ordeal. Her sister did not make it through. She got sick while she was there. Um, but Corey ended up living through it, and Corey was a very faithful woman, a very faithful Christian woman. So when she got back home, she went out and started telling her story, telling her story. And one of her stories was that she had to learn to forgive the guard that treated them so poorly there when they were in the, uh, in the um, Auschwitz. Um, one time when she was giving a talk, that exact guard actually was at one of her talks. And she tells the story how she had to go up to him and verbally forgive him. Corey was an amazing woman, 
But I tell you this because when she got older, she said to God, well, God, I think I'm finished now and I'm gonna go out and get myself an easy chair. <laughs> and I'm gonna get one of those big chairs and put it in front of the TV. And God said, no, Corey, I want you to go get some suitcases. <laughs> and she said, suitcases? Why would I need suitcases? And he said, because I'm not finished with you yet. I'm not finished with you yet. And she spent the next seven or eight years on the road. She has a book she calls Tramp for the Lord. <laughs> and she spent the next years of her life continuing to tell her story and tell her story of faith and tell her story of forgiveness. And if you haven't read her story, it's Hiding Place is her first book, and that's where she tells the story of, and it's also a movie, Hiding, The Hiding Place. And then Tramp for the Lord was one of her follow-up books where she talks about um, how God did, wasn't finished with her yet. Okay, so I wanna just talk about this, and then we're gonna uh, break. First, we're gonna have a break, and then come back, and we're gonna do some process, okay? So I have one more um, thing I wanna talk about here, too. Are we rooted or stuck? So the first thing we're to, I want to talk about is rootedness in, in the disciples' journey, the women of discipleship journey. So these are things when we're rooted um, in our lives, we find ourselves at home with who we are, ever open to growth. We find our, this competency of being our authentic, autonomous self, yet also desiring to share in friendship with others and be in community with others. Can be peaceful, productive, content, intimate and generative. And then we also are fruitful for ourselves and others. One of the signs of of being a true disciple and, and walking with the Lord also is our fruit basket. I refer to it as our fruit basket, that we always have to be looking at our fruit baskets in life. Are they full? Are we producing fruit? What, what does that look like? What does that look like in our lives? This comes from actually a book called The Enduring Heart, which is by Wilkie Au, and um, you know, he's uh, actually, I think he just retired, or retired a couple of years ago as a professor at L LMU, but um, he's written a number of wonderful books around the heart, talking about things of the heart. Um, so this is the first part, if you're rooted, this is what your life would look like. And of course, being rooted is also being able to be watered by God and by uh, the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then we could also be stuck. We could be stuck. We let past failures, poor decisions, poor decision makings about different things, unforgiving, cynical. We hang on to resentments in our lives towards different things. We let ill health or normal aches and pains and growing old make us crabby. <laughs> and sometimes unappreciative of our other blessings. We let the envy of others consume us, the comparison traps. We compare ourselves to others, what they look like, what they have, all of those things. That can get us stuck. So rather than gratefully acknowledging what we do have and developing our own gifts, and when fear of failure present, uh, prevents us from trying new things, and when we let fear of anything, anything at all, rule our lives, we get stuck. So when we're stuck, we can move into things like this when we're stuck. Um, Ruth Haley Barton is one of my favorite authors, and she has this wonderful uh, book and also a, a program called uh, Sacred Rhythms. These are part of the sacred rhythms that she invites us as women, especially as women, you know, to have this desire, this longing for more in the spiritual life. Solitude and silence, creating more space for God in many ways through prayer, through time. You know, even in your car, just driving, just to turn off the radio and just create that space, that quietness. 
when my children were younger and I would drop them off at school or whatever and I would have time in the car by myself. Um, I remember reading this book called uh, My Minivan is My Monastery. <laughs> And you know, we can do that in our lives, create these places, these quiet places, even driving in a car, you know, that can become our monasteries, our places that we meet with God. Lexio Divina, that beautiful practice of sitting with scripture and reading scripture and letting scripture really infuse us. You know, sitting with certain words that really uh, speak to us and praying then to God about what that means for us right at that exact day. I also want to mention a, a wonderful prayer app. You know, we all have phones of some kind, droids or something, um, iPhones. But it's called Pray As You Go. And I don't know if any, some of you may have it and may use it. But it's a wonderful app on your phone. It's produced by the um, Irish Jesuits. And it's just a 15-minute type of morning devotional. And it has beautiful music it changes. Their music changes all the time. It's from around the world. Um, they focus on one of the readings for the day and then have a reflection. It's usually just, like I said, about 15 minutes, but if you're in the car, if you're home, it's a beautiful way to start your day. And it's actually the number one app now, one of the number one Catholic apps now, but I just want to mention that because it's, it's a wonderful resource. Um, oh, it's called Pray As You Go. Pray As You Go. Right. Okay, and honoring the body. You know, this flesh and blood spirituality, we're not separate from our bodies. And as we embrace our bodies, embrace everything about our bodies, but also realizing the connection to the spiritual. You know, even when you do body work, when you talk about yoga, when you talk about uh, Pilates or any type of body work, or even just laying down quietly, you know, or just sitting quietly, that connection of our bodies and that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit and how we continually have to respect our bodies, those beautiful bodies that God gave us. And the examen, you know, bringing our whole self to God every evening when we reflect on our days, we reflect where God was and where God wasn't. And also, when I think of the examen, I think about creating what the Celtic people refer to as side chapels. You know, trying to create those side chapels during our day where we step aside from whatever's happening and we create side chapels where we can commune with God and pray with God. And a rule of life. You know, the Benedictines, any of the, of the orders, you know, the mendicant orders, they, they have these rules, you know, rule of life. and and. A rule of life is not to uh, restrict you in any way. It's actually to give you more life and a freedom. And um, there's wonderful ways you can do this. Even online, there's outlines for creating your own rule of life. You know, this is probably another whole talk right here. <laughs> but, but I wanted to put this in here because it's so important because we cannot be women disciples and working towards that, towards being better women disciples without having these things in order in our life and especially our prayer life because you know i say that i ask the question many times when i'm doing workshops too that is prayer your spare tire or, or is it your steering wheel and that's something we also have to look at in our lives because you know, we can get lazy with prayer or just rely on prayer when we need to pray and all those things, but it's such a core essential of our lives as, as women disciples. It's such a core essential. 